Okay, so um, this video is about chapter seven. Um, we talk about hypothesis test and confidence interval in a multiple regression setting. Okay, so um, for this uh, chapter, the only thing we need to focus on is um, the the typical hypothesis test and confidence interval, which which we probably already are very familiar with. And then the only new thing here is the joint hypothesis test, okay? Um, and the rest of it is not required. Um, if you have time, you can read about it. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, for one single coefficient, the t-test, p-value, and confidence interval is still the same. OK, you just focus on that specific coefficient. For example, if it's beta 1 hat, then um, according to central limit theorem, beta 1 hat minus um, expectation of beta 1 hat divided by the variance of beta 1 hat, the square root of the variance of beta 1 hat is normally distributed. So using this um, normal distribution a characteristic we can do confidence interval right so a confidence interval for beta one hat will be beta one hat plus or minus a certain value depends on the confidence you need times the standard error of beta one hat okay i think there there is something missing here but but that's fine um so so two for beta two all the way to beta k um, what's the meaning of k? Okay, so the lowercase k is the number of x variables. Okay. Uh, lowercase k is the number of x variables. So if you have x1, x2, then lowercase k equals to 2. If you have x1 all the way to x10, then lowercase k is 10. All right. And I just mentioned that there should be something over here. OK, doesn't matter. OK. All right. Um, so for example, if you have um, a test scores, regress test scores on student teacher ratio, or regress test scores on student teacher ratio and percentage of English learner. Then if I ask you to do a hypothesis test on this coefficient, um, then you can basically, let's say, um, or, or ask you to do a confidence interval for this coefficient, then what you are gonna do is just minus 1.1 plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error, which is time. Uh, 0.43. Um, at the same way, if I ask you to do a confidence interval for this one, you would do the same. And if I ask you to calculate t statistics, then you would you would divide minus 0.65 divided by my a point zero three one. Okay. Then once you get t statistics, um, getting the p value is the routine that we have performed before. Okay, I wish, I wish you guys haven't forget everything we learned before midterm. Okay, so, um, uh, this is this is what happened in a stata output. Um. So if, if you if you take a look at here, these are the these are the beta one hat and beta two hat. These are the standard error for beta one hat and beta two hat. And these are the t statistics and p value and confidence interval ninety five percent in this case for beta one hat and beta two hat. Okay. Um. So that's a good thing about um, once you perform a large data set, let's say if you have a project, a data project for some class, then using a statistics software, 
okay, will be very convenient. You don't need to calculate t statistic or p value by yourself. But um, in this class, you are supposed to calculate that on your own. Okay. Um, so the only thing new here in this chapter is this thing called a uh, test of joint hypothesis. Okay. Um, so what is joint hypothesis? So let's start with an example that we have. Um, in this case, we have three X variables. The first one is student-teacher ratio. Um, the second one is expenditure per pupil. Okay. Um, and the third one is percentage in of English learner. Um, and what joint tests want to do is um, they want to test whether beta 1 and beta 2 are 0 at the same time. Or the now, now hypothesis is school resources doesn't matter. OK, so which are the variables that is related to um, school resources? Um, clearly, there is x1. And then clearly there is X2 because X1 is about how much teachers you hire and X2 is about how much money you spend on each student. So the now hypothesis is do they combine together doesn't make a difference for test scores. Okay. Um, how do you understand a, a joint hypothesis? Um, the easier way to think about it is um, in a now hypothesis, both of them are equal to zero. Okay, that means X1 has no effect on test scores and X2 has no effect on test scores. Okay, um, what we are saying here is the true value. Okay, we don't know the true value. We don't know the true effect. We can only calculate a sample one. We can only calculate whether X1 and X2 has an impact on test score in our sample. But um, we are making the assumption that in the real world that school resources is not, not something that matters. It's, it's the student quality that matters, okay? So, um, what's its alternative? The alternative is either one of them or both matters. Okay. Um, so in this case, we're testing beta one and beta two together. We're not testing them one by one. Um, and you can think of that. Um, this is something that some statisticians think of to do it more conveniently that they combined and then test whether it's useful or not. If it's not useful, then both of them are zero. Okay, we, we or we cannot reject that both of them are zero. If both of them combined is significant, then we don't know which one is significant, but we can say that, oh, either one of them or maybe both of them has an impact on test scores, okay? And then if you need to continue to figure out which one is significant, then you continue to do a t-test, okay? But the focus here is whether they combined have an effect on y or not. Okay, so how do we do it? Um, uh, First, we set up our um, hypothesis, okay? We have an H0 or H0, and then we also have an alternative hypothesis, that's H1. Um, we will not do that one by one, okay? We will do them combined. So this is what they will do, okay? Uh, so here are some uh, explanation about why we are not going to do them at the same time. Um, I'm going to skip this part because um, 
because this is this is not really important, but you guys can read about it. Um, okay. Um, this is what we're gonna do. Okay, we're gonna do the second solution, which we use a different test statistic designed to test them both together at once, which is called an F statistics. Okay, um, there's also a solution one, which is called using a different critical value. Um, but we're not we're not going to learn this because normally people don't use it. Okay. Okay, this one is not required. This is what we're going to learn. Okay, so I think the previous two pages just an explanation about why we're not going to try to do them one by one. But instead, we're going to do them all together. Um, I think intuitively the reason is that um, x, these two x variables might be correlated, so their effects might be, um, how, how do I say, um, you, can, you can imagine that two variables are correlated, so they might contain some information about each other, um, so there is a chance that both of them are not significant, but two of them combined is significant, okay? But anyways, as long as we need to test something that has more than one beta, then we have to use an F test, okay? So now let's take a look at what is an F test. Um, we are going to uh, we're going to calculate a score, which is called um, F statistics. It's very, very similar to T statistics. Okay, it's a um, statistic value that we calculate, and then we'll base on that value to calculate a p value. Okay, um, it so the F statistic test or parts of a joint hypothesis as once. The formula for the special case of the joint hypothesis, beta one equals to beta one zero and beta two equals to beta two zero. So you can imagine that these two numbers can be zero or can be one or can be any other things. Okay, I'm saying this and this. So these two are the hypothesis value. You can think of them as zero or let's say three or any other value, okay? It could be 5.5 or minus seven, anything. Um, so you can think of that as we have two regressors and we're trying to combine T1, which is the T statistic of the first um, coefficient and T1 square plus T2 square minus a correlation between T1 and T2. Okay, so the correction to be made here is that we believe that X1 and X2 are correlated so that there is something correlated between T1 and T2. We want to correct that so that there will be a case when oh, both coefficients are not significant, but th that they combined shows a significant effect on Y. Um, and at the end, we will reject when F statistic is large. Okay. Um, the question is how large? Uh, we're going to figure that out. Okay. Um, one th more thing here is that um, this equation is not required. Okay. This equation is not required. But um, next page, I think there is another equation that is required. I'll point you. Uh, I'll point it out for you. Okay. Um, a little bit, a little bit more information about F statistics. So you don't really need to learn F statistic and F distribution, but you need to know that it's something similar to T statistics, and um, F statistic is large when T one and T two are large, because um, F is positively related to T1 and T2. 
but um, it corrects in the right way for the correlation between them. Okay, so if, if T1 and T2 are correlated, then F statistic corrects the part of it. Okay, um, the formula for more than two beta is nasty. Okay, um, it's surprised that uh, the slides is gonna use, use this kind of um, words unless you use matrix algebra. Okay, so what does this mean? This basically means that um, in most of the cases in reality, we calculate F statistic using a machine. Okay, we don't use your brain to calculate F statistic. Your brain is useful to interpret the results of F statistic, while the machine is useful to calculate F statistic, okay? So that says um, you need to learn how to calculate, sorry, that, that says you, you need to first understand how to interpret F statistics. Okay. Um, this, this is, a, this is a, a special case. Okay, I think we can skip this. Um, this special case is just if T1 and T2 are independent, then if they're independent, then the correlation between them is zero. So then the row part is, um, uh, the row part should disappear. And we end up having F equals to uh, 0.5 times T1 square plus T2 square. Um, if you learned, if you have learned about um, distribution, then this is a chi-square distribution. Okay, so this one is a chi-square distribution. This one is a chi-square distribution. Okay, um, it's complicated. Um, it's not required. But anyway, at the end, F is distributed as a chi-square distribution divided by Q. And what is Q? Q is a degree of freedom. Okay. Um, okay. So this this part is is really not required. Um, what we what we need to know is just F statistic is large when T1 and T2 are large, and F statistic is important. The reason why we need that is because we want to correct the correlation between T1 and T2. If F statistic cannot correct the correlation between them, then why don't we just do T1 and T2 separately? Yeah, so, so the reason why we don't do them separately is because we want to correct them. Um, we want to correct the correlation and we want to do it in this, in, at once. So that's why we need F statistics, okay. Um, we don't need, really need to figure out the chi-square distribution or F distribution. What we need to do is here, okay? So um, there was a simple formula for F statistic that holds only on the homoscida statisticity. Um, if you remember what is homoscida statisticity, it is the distribution of error is the same across different X value. But if you don't understand what is homoscida statisticity, it's still okay because it says this isn't very useful. Okay. All right, so what does it mean? It means that um, we have to figure out a way that is easier to calculate F statistic. And um, the most convenient way is to assume that there is almost like elasticity so that we can use R squares to calculate F statistics. All right. So here is how they do it. All right. Um, if you don't understand the previous part, it's okay. But now you have to kind of really understand what's going on. How do we calculate F statistics? This is what we want to do. First, we have our original regression and we call them unrestricted regression. Okay, so let's write it down. This is the original regression. Okay, we call it 
unrestricted. Restricted. Um, why do we call it unrestricted? Because we haven't done anything to it yet. Okay. You can think of that as I have not restricted anything on it. So the original regression is unrestricted regression. So what is a restricted regression? Hmm. How do I? Okay. So what is a restricted regression? Um, if we want to restrict that, um, we're going to take away the variables that we want to test a join test. Okay. So remember which one? Um, the first one is student teacher ratio because um, how much teachers I hire is um, school resources. And the second one is expenditure per pupil. So we're going to take these two out. Okay. And what we end up getting is a restricted regression. So, okay, these things you need to remember. A restricted regression, you can think of it, take, um, uh, take our testing, um, or take the variables that you want to test away. Mm, let me think, okay. Take the test ver x variables away. And then you end up getting a restricted regression. OK. Okay, so so here is, is simple. The first one you need to understand is we have an original regression and now we give it a new name that is called unrestricted. Okay, and in some case, we probably call it U because it's unrestricted. Okay, we call this one U. Um, this one is unrestricted because I haven't done anything to it yet. It's the original regression. Um, the second regression is we want to take the variables that we want to test away because the now hypothesis is that these two variables have no effect. So if they have no effect, why not just take it away, right? Because in your now hypothesis, they don't have any effect that school resources doesn't matter. So we take them away and we end up having um, just percentage of English learner left. So this is a restricted regression. And in the future, we are going to call it R. OK. So again, we have two regressions. The original one is called U. It's because it's unrestricted. The one that have the variables taken away because in the now hypothesis that it doesn't matter. It's called R because they are restricted regression. OK, so the number of regressions under H0 is Q equals to 2. OK, this lowercase Q is important. You also need to remember what it means. It means that you have two restrictions that are placed on your original regression. Why is it two? Because you have taken two variables away, okay? Suppose you take three variables away, then Q equals to three. If you take um, Q variables away, then the Q is two, Q. All right. Um, the fit will be better in the unrestricted regression. Um, this means that R square of U is going to be larger than R square of Q. Sorry, R square of 
are. Um, and what's the reason of that? Because in our in in the in the R uh, regression, you only have percentage of English learner, and in U, you also have student teacher ratio and expenditure per pupil. By now, um, as long as they are not exactly zero, then um, R square of U is going to be larger than R square of R. Okay. So um, F statistic is going to take a look at how large is the increase for R square to be judged as statistically significant. Okay. So you have an R square for R. You have an R square for U. Oops. Um, and you are going to have an increase from R square of R to R square of U. And F statistic is going to take a look at how large that increase is. If the increase is a lot, then you may be judged as, oh, by adding these two variables into it, um, the R square increase dramatically, which means that they do contain information for test scores. and in that way, I can say, okay, that means that school resources matters. Okay, we reject no hypothesis. But if the R square only increased a little bit, then F statistic will show that, okay, this is not significant, um, which means that we, we fail to reject no hypothesis. We fail to reject that school resources doesn't matter. All right. Um, Okay, so this is the equation you need to remember and um, you have exercise for it. Um, and you need to understand every single term in this regression. Okay, so the first one is R square of unrestricted. We can also call it R square of U because it's unrestricted. Okay, minus R square of restricted. So, of which one is which it might be confusing in the beginning but now you have to kind of figure out what which one is which okay the unrestricted regression is the one with three variables while the restricted regression is the one with one variables um q is the number of re uh, restrictions which is the number um of variables that you have taken away um k is the number of regressors in the unrestricted regression. So in the original regression, there is three X variables. So K equals three. Um, how about lowercase n? By now you should remember that lowercase n is the number of sample, sorry, um, the size of the sample, okay? All right. So let's take a look at how do we calculate the F statistic in the previous example. Okay. Uh, whoops. Um, we have two regressions. This is the original one. Okay. So R square of U is point four three six six and then we have a restricted one okay this is the r square of r okay or maybe it's easier to write it in this way right looks looks easier okay um and then um, how about Q? Q equals to two because you have two restrictions. How about K? K is three because you have three variables in your original regression. Okay. So Q is three, uh, sorry, Q is two, K is three, N is 420. I don't know where they, they set N. Okay, probably somewhere before. So you put into all the information, okay? Be careful about the R squares. 
So 0. 0.41 goes to here. Mm, and how about 0. 0.43? 0. 0.43 goes to here and here. Right? So we use 0.4149 once, but we use the original R squared twice. Okay, so you have exercise about how to calculate this. Um, and what you end up getting the F statistic is 8.01. Um, it says the note to heteroscedasticity robust F square, uh, F statistic at 5.43. Um, I don't think this is really important, but um, so 8.01 is what you need. Okay, now we need to figure out the p-value for 8.01. Hmm. So this page is just explaining to you why homoscedasticity only F statistic is, is not equals to homoscedasticity robust F, F statistics. Um, at the end, they don't really matter so far. Um, Okay, so so this is F distribution. And this table is where we can find the, the p value. Okay, I'm gonna make it larger so that you can see. Um, F, F statistic have two, um, what is this called? Um, degree of freedom. So first degree of freedom is called uh, Q. Um, remember Q we have is two, right? The second one is N minus K minus one. Um, in our case is 420 minus three minus one, which is 418. So how do we find the P value for 8.01. This is what we need. Okay. Um, so here's the, the, the critical values for F distribution. Um, when the second degree of freedom is infinite, F distribution looks like this. Um, this degree of freedom is degree of freedom of Q. So this is the Q we have, which is two. Okay, but 418 is not infinite. How can you use this? Um, my argument is that 418 is big enough um, to, to use this. And your question probably is how large is large enough? And my answer is usually, it's large because uh, we, we don't really have a sample that has only 10 people, right? It's, we always have a sample with, let's say 400 stu uh, school districts or 500 people. Um, so, so, so my argument is as long as N is large, then we can, we can take the second degree of freedom as, as infinite. Okay. All right, so um, for significance level, if your F is larger than 2.3, then you are significant at 10%. Okay, let me repeat that again. Um, if Q is two, then you look horizontally to the next value, which is 2.3. It says that if your F statistic is larger than 2.3, then you are significant at 10% level. Okay, so our F is 8.01. It is larger than 2.3. So we know it's um, significant at 10%. Um, and then we continue. Um, this says that if your F statistic is larger than three, then your um, F test is significant at 5% level. So again, because F is 8.01, it is significant, okay? 
And if you continue to go, you'll find out that, oh, it's even significant at 1% level. That's very good, right? Um, and if you, if you take a look at all of these numbers that are required to get to 1% significance, um, then you have an idea about how large your F statistic needs. So as long as your F is larger than 7, 8, 10, then usually your F statistic is significant, right? Because all of these numbers are smaller than 6. Um, OK, um, we do not require to use this table in your exercise or exam. It's just a way for you to have an idea about how do we approach the F statistics, right? Because calculating the p-value is the job of the machine. Your job is to understand how to interpret the results. And here, your job is to know that as long as F is larger than 7, 8, or 10, then you're very confident to say that, oh, this joint test is significant. We reject the null hypothesis. OK. All right. That is clear. OK, so, so the only job here you, know, you need to know is um, first, memorize this um, equation, memorize the meaning of every single item, and learn how to calculate it once you are given these numbers. OK, and then once you get the F statistic is 8.01, you can confidently say that this is a significant test. We can reject the null hypothesis, OK? And if we reject the null hypothesis, then, then what does it mean? It means that student-teacher ratio and expenditure per pupil combined is significant, OK? Or combined has an effect on test score. All right. And this table is not required, OK? All right, summary. You guys can read it on your own. Mm. OK, that's it. Um, and that's it for the chapter 7.